Hey guys, how you doing? Uh, welcome to part three of our 10 part series on shooting the IDF way. Uh, today we're gonna to be talking about ballistics and zeroing, and um, I'm glad you're here to join us. Uh, first off, before we start, uh, this is our uh, uh, third time we're doing this, and the first time I did this, I was uh, a lot heavier. So some of my so-called friends kind of hit me that I have this beer belly and stuff like that. So since the first show, Part one, I've lost 34 pounds already. So it only happened because of this live Facebook. If we wouldn't be doing this, no one would be making fun of me. So that's one positive thing that came out of here. Um, it's great to be here, and we're gonna start talking a little about ballistics. When we, in the IDF, the way we do things, um, I had the honor of building all six zeroing targets that the IDF used in, in the time that I was in charge of their marksmanship unit from 1993 to 2010. So I built six different uh, zeroing targets, and we're gonna talk about how to do that. And I also had the honor of building actual the, in the ballistic trajectories of the weapons, about 18 different ones. So I actually was the guy shooting and building the ballistic trajectory ourselves. Um, I never believed in the tables and the Excel tables that I was given. I thought it was too much of like a vacuum, it was too much of, 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 of st sterile stuff. So I always believe that you have to actually shoot and see exactly where you hit and then you understand a little bit more. So we're going to talk about a lot of stuff today and ballistics and zeroing have to be combined. You can't understand ballistics without understanding zeroing and you can't understand zeroing without understanding ballistics. But sometimes it scares us because there's physics involved and we don't even want to know that and it confuses us and all we know is point of aim, point of contact. And well, we're, gonna, we're gonna go into depth today, but we're gonna do it in a simple way. And I think that once you guys understand it, it becomes much, much simpler to understand. And then you can use this in the range when you guys are in the range. Okay, so let's start, let's go to work. The first step is trying to understand what are we talking about when we're talking about defining the zero ring? What is zero ring? Basically, I'm trying to calibrate. I'm doing calibration between my sight, whatever it is, it can be a backup sight, it can be an optic sight, it can be a telescope, with my point of, a, point of impact and a certain range. So a lot of people you hear you say, I'm gonna zero at 25. So they're aiming at 25 at a certain target and they're zeroing it to where they're aiming. Well, in the IDF, we don't do that. In the IDF, we use what we call a target that we put at 25 meters, but we do not hit where we're aiming, okay? Now, this is very, very, very different and we have to understand there are many, many different types of guns, many different types of lengths of barrels. When you think about what, what affects ballistics, there are many things, but the three major ones is barrel length, because that's speed of bullet, height of sight above bore, above the barrel, critical. Those two things are incredibly important, and the third one is the bullet itself. Am I using an M855, am I using an M193, different weights, different trajectories. Those three are the main, you know, canting the weapon is difficult as well, temperature, wind, but those three are the top three that you need to, uh, to talk about, and we're gonna be talking about it. So when we talk about zeroing, we do zeroing once every six weeks in the IDF. We do it in supporting position, so there's a support underneath our left arm, our weak arm, for our righty. And we also do it always that the height of the target is exact same height of the barrel. We do not want to aim high when we're zeroing. We do not want to aim low when we're zeroing. So we want it exactly at 12 o'clock at the height of the barrel. Incredibly important. When we zero, what we want to do is make the smallest group possible. We want our group size to be incredibly small. Now we do five rounds in the IDF. I know you guys do two sets of three. I think you guys are moving now to five, but let me show the way, the way it's done. So when we go about making a, a zeroing target, we build the target exactly the way the site is. So we have, I'll show you three different types. We have one, and this is at 25 meters. That's a half a circle. We have one that's like a diamond. And we have one that's a circle. It's all a black circle. And we have different kinds of circles. Now, this is the way we do it. Why do we do this? Every one of these targets is fit for the type of aiming device I'm using, am I using iron sights? Am I using crosshairs in a telescope? Am I using a red dot? 
every one of my certain type of aiming systems, I need to adapt it to the correct target. Why? Because I want to lock my sight on the target. I don't want it to move because I want the group size to be smaller. So if I'm using an iron sight, whether it be an AK or an AR, my iron sight, as we once spoke about, it's about 11.2 centimeters at 25. So we made this target to be exactly 11.2, which is the size of the front sight at 25. But let's say I'm using an ACOG or a telescope, then I take a, 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 a diamond, let's say a telescope is normally about one, uh, 0 0.1 milli, so it's about one centimeter at 100. We build a triangle, we build a little diamond, and then we cut the diamond into four different triangles. Sorry about my, my writing here. So when I use a crosshair, I always use a diamond. When I use an iron sight, I always use a half a moon. When I use a red dot, I always use a dot. So now I'm able to lock my sight on the target. So let's say we're using a red dot. Sorry about my back, guys. So I put it inside here. The dot will always be smaller than the, the, the target itself because we want to see a black circle around my red dot. And this way there's a circle surrounding my reticle and I go back to that all five times, all five shots. This way I can have a return of aiming. I, that's why I always had difficulties trying to understand the, the uh, American targets because you don't know exactly where you're aiming when you're aiming at the silhouette. So we develop targets depending on what side I'm using. Now, we start getting really complicated. When we shoot at 25 meters, none of our guns, none of our sights hit exactly where we're aiming. We hit at different points on the target at 25. So on our target at 25 meters, we have these little circles. You can't see them from the firing line. These are not relevant, okay? But what we do see is that each one of these guns, each one of these, these little points is built for a different gun, a different barrel length, a different round, or a different sight. So it, it, depending on what, what gun you're using and what sight you're using and what round you're using, you then know where you need to bring it to. So on all of our targets on the bottom, you have a little like map. And it says, okay, if you're using an SS-109 or M855 round, this is where you need to hit. If you're using a long barrel, this is where you need to hit. So it, it explains to you on the bottom where you have to bring it. I'm putting the target at 25 meters, but I'm not hitting at 25 meters. I'm either hitting low or I'm hitting high, but I'm not hitting exactly at 25, okay? Now, when we zero, the whole idea is to get to the, pro the point where, where I'm aiming, I'm hitting. So when we look at ballistics, right, when the, the barrel is always has an up angle towards the sky. That's why when the bullet leaves, it's going up. How do they do this? The front sight is always lower than the back sight, okay? So if this is my eye, right, and I'm running my, this is my field of view here, okay? This is where my eye is. So the barrel is underneath. In order to bring the back side, I'm gonna do this a little bit easier, to here, and the front side to here, now I'm building a straight line. When the bullet leaves the barrel, it goes up, and then it goes down. This little parabola is never equal. It will always be, it goes up fast, it, it, it goes down the bullet faster because of gravity than it does go up, but I'll explain that in a second. So what happens, there's two points of contact. Once on the way up, and then it gets to its apex, and then once on the way down. There's two different points, okay? I'm gonna ask you guys a question now, and start thinking about it. When is there one point of contact with, the, uh, with, the, with, the, with my eye, and when, the, when is there none, okay? Normally there's two, but my question to you is when is there one, and when is there zero? So right now, there, the bullet goes up, and then it goes down. You hear a lot of people in the American military saying, point of aim, point of impact, 25, 300. Ridiculous. It's just mind-boggling, okay? Now, well, the way we do it in the IDF, we decided, and I'll explain this, that our second point of impact, which is critical, is at 250 meters. Every single gun, every single sight in the IDF is zero that the second point of contact is at 250. But the first point of contact changes drastically depending on barrel length, round and height of size. So we have multiple trajectories that they all hit at the second point at 250, but the first point is at a different place. Now let's try to explain that. 
If my barrel is longer, what's going to happen, my round is going to be faster, okay? It's fa faster leaving the gun. If my barrel is shorter, the round's gonna be slower. By the way, the flash that leaves the weapon changes also depending on length of barrel. If you take a long barrel, what happens, you push, you pull the trigger, gas starts pushing the bullet, boom, boom, it's pushing, 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 it leaves the barrel, the gas that wasn't used goes into the, to the air and that's your flash. When you're doing a shorter barrel, there's a shorter push, so it has less velocity. It goes into the air and now you have more gas that was not used to push, so you have more flash. We see a difference between a, a long barrel and a short barrel, almost 100, 150 yards at night, you can see farther a guy shooting with a short barrel because more flash leaves the weapon. The shorter the barrel, the slower the bullet. The slower the bullet, the more flash that's going out of the barrel. Okay, there's a correlation between the two. Now, all of these ranges, depending on, you're gonna have a flatter, a flatter path when the barrel is longer because the bullet is faster. So the longer your barrel, the more flat it's going to be. So if we would take our four guns that we use in the 90s in the IDF, we use what we call a Galil, a, ga a Galilon, I don't even know how to write that in here, but that's a short Galil. We use an M16 long, and we use an M16 short. Those were our four guns. Now when you look who had the longest barrel, the M16, so it was hitting at 42 meters and 250. The next longest one was the Galil, it was hitting at 40 and 250. The next longest one was the M16 short. It was hitting at 18 and 250. And the Glenon, which had the shortest barrel, was doing at 15 and 250. Again, I have to explain. Because the barrel is shorter, I still want to get to 250. But because it's shorter, it's slower. Then how do I get to the same 250? I have to angle the barrel higher up towards the sky for it to get to the same range because we all want to hit a 250. We'll explain why in a second. So in order to do that, you must understand, I need a shorter barrel to be up against the sky higher, and that's why it crosses my eye at a closer range. The shorter the barrel, the sooner it will cut through the eye for, for the first time. The second time, they're all going to be at 250. So I need to angle the barrel higher. How do I do that? Very, very simple. When you zero at 25, you zero at a higher space than where I'm aiming. So if I'm aiming here at 25, but I'm hitting above, what does that mean? The bullet started underneath my line of sight, right? So if, it, if it's above me at 25 already, the bullet is hitting higher than where I'm aiming. That means before 25, it passed my, si my line of view, my line of sight, and it's higher up. So I'm zeroing it to here. That means it had to hit before 25. By the way, this is the short M16. This is 80 meters. So you can look at a zeroing target and understand already the higher ones are always the shorter barrels, the lower ones are always the longer barrels. And you can see if they contacted before 25, or after 25 just by where I'm aiming, because I'm always aiming here. This is where I aim. Now the question is, where's the impact? So we don't have any that we're hitting exactly where we're aiming. We don't do that. So every time, if you want to change the trajectory of a round, it's very simple. A gun doesn't come with a trajectory. The M16 or the M4 don't have a trajectory, okay? You can change all of that. You change that very simply by zeroing it differently. If I take a short M16 right now, and instead of hitting here like we do in the IDF, I decide for the hell of it, I wanna hit here. What I'm going to do, I'm gonna to have to angle my barrel higher up so the bullet will get here. If I'm, if I'm hitting here, the barrel is pointing here, right? So I am now angling my barrel even higher. That means the whole trajectory is gonna change. It's not gonna be 250 anymore. If I bring my point of impact higher and higher on 25, all I'm doing is building a bigger trajectory I'm cutting much earlier, and I'm gonna finish much later because I'm building a bigger set. Now here's where I happen to disagree with the Americans if you guys are doing it at 300. The farther this point is, the farther the second point is, the larger trajectory you're going to have. If I now want, instead of hitting at 250, I wanna hit, like you guys do, or some of you guys do, at 300. In order for my round to get here, 
The only way for me to do this is to angle my barrel even higher. So now let's say, let's cut, a, let's cut a lot of these down so it'll be easier for you guys to understand. So let's just say for the hell of it, it's 42 and 250. But now I don't want to hit 250, I want to hit 300 like you guys do. Now I'm going to have to break it earlier. I'm going to have to make the trajectory higher. And now I'm hitting a 300. But what's the problem with what I just did? Because the trajectory is higher, this is not good. Why is a higher trajectory bad? It's farther away from where I'm aiming at. This blue line, this line in the middle here, the blue, it's my line of aim. The round is either hitting here, this could be like plus six at 100. This could be plus 28 at 100 centimeters. So now what's happening, I'm aiming at a head target at 100, and I'm putting my side here, I'm now hitting him above his head. So I will miss targets because of a trajectory being so big. And how far do you normally shoot? You know, you don't want it to be so far. So the way we decided in the IDF, we said that in battle, we're expecting our enemy to be able to hit, to be, we able to hit our enemy up to 300 with iron sights, no magnification. So what we did, we decided instead of zeroing at 300, we're gonna zero at 50, 50 yards less. So we decided we're gonna do it at 250. What was the thinking behind this? If you take this path at 300, you're gonna be around minus 13 centimeters, which is nothing. Our whole system of building tra trajectory was, we understand that the enemy is not going with a sign, I'm at 170 yards. I don't know where he is. So what we wanted you to be able to do, I don't care where he is. If you aim at a shoulder target and you put your sight like on the third bottom, you're gonna hit him no matter what. I don't care if he's at 20, he's at 90, he's at 150, or he's at 300. Because the trajectory was so flat that it's very, very close to where you're aiming. So that would be the idea to do it. And that's why we decided to do it this way. We said the farthest point we're gonna ever shoot is 300, we're gonna zero at 250. So now we're making the trajectory a little bit flatter, okay? And not as extreme and as, not as big numbers. And now it's easier to hit the target on the way. Sometimes, by the way, I don't know if you guys know this, we can use the iron sight. We said it's 11.2 centimeters at 25. So at 100, it's 44, 45, which by the way, is the width of a person. So if you're ever aiming at someone with an iron sight, and you see that your sight is the same width of the target, he's at 100. If your sight is half, you know he's at 50. If your sight is double, you know he's at 200. It's very, very general, but allows me as a shooter to know, should I aim low, should I aim high? So this is a way to judge the distance of an enemy without having a, you know, a laser range finder and stuff like that that the regular grunt guys don't have. So what we, what we spoke about today is, right now, is which targets we have. You make the target depending on which reticle you have. The difference between length of barrel, because we spoke about the speed, now the weight of bullet. When we, when we look at the SS-109 or the M855, they're very similar, against the M193, what is the major difference? The major difference between them is weight. Okay, sorry about my back. The green one, as you guys know, the green tip one, the SS-109, the M855, has a, has a steel tip inside. It's better for penetration. It's not armor piercing, but it's better for penetration. And because the round is shaped a little bit differently, it's a little bit longer, and it weighs more, its trajectory is different than the M193. The green bullet, green to bullet, goes out of the gun slower than the M193. Because it's heavier, it leaves slower. But it's like having a a truck against a car. If they're both going at, let's say, 50 miles an hour, to stop the truck, it's going to be harder. So what happens is, when a bullet leaves the barrel, the, the exact middle second that leaves the barrel, it starts slowing down, the bullet. Why? Because there's nothing pushing it anymore, okay? So now it just has its friction. So it starts slowing down. The heavier bullet loses its speed slower than the M193, the lighter bullet. So the heavier round keeps its energy longer than the M193. This is incredibly relevant for the IDF. Because the green bullet is heavier, you must spin it inside the barrels. We call it slivim in Hebrew. You must sp spin it in, and we, with the green one, the, one the, the IDF, we use a one to seven twist. That means every seven inches, the bullet does 360 degrees inside the barrel, okay? 
Bec if we would use a standard M16, which is a 1 to 12 that we have in Israel, what would happen, the green bullet is so much heavier than M855, 62 grain against 55. Because it's heavier, what's going to happen, it's not going to turn around enough. And then you know what happens to the round? It starts flipping. And you'll see at 25 meters already, you're going to see a keyhole. It does like little keyholes of the round. It hits the target on its side. So if I use a heavy bullet and a slow twist of a barrel, 1 to 12 or 1 to 11, you will see the bullet will already turn over at a very, very close range. This happens at 25 already, okay? So it's a no-no. If you're using an M855 SS109, a heavier round, you must use a faster twist, either one to seven or one to nine, okay? The opposite, by the way, is not true. This, by the way, was mind-boggling for us. We brought in the M4s before you guys were using it, even though it's your gun. And we started using this in 1996, 97, we started putting our first M4s in, in, in the IDF. Um, and we, we needed the shorter barrels. We just needed, uh, we didn't believe in the long distance because we're doing a lot of CQB, getting out of barrel, getting out of uh, vehicles and BMPs and all. So we thought once we got those barrels from you guys, the one to sevens, we thought that this is for the green tip and the one to 12 is for the one and 193. That's what we thought. We thought that there was a correlation between the weight of the bullet and the spin of the barrel. It made perfect sense, but we were wrong. I remember this guy's name was uh, Zener Sharolnik. He lived up in the north of Israel. And he calls me up and he says, Mikey, when I'm shooting the M193 through the one to seven barrel of the M4, we only have the upper receivers in the beginning, we're doing better groupings than we're doing with the, with the green tip, with the SS109 or the M855. I said, no way, my friend, you're smoking something. No way, and he was from a kibbutz and they do smoke in Israel and stuff like that. But, but I said, no way, the Americans didn't screw that up. He says, come. I was serving in Lebanon, I was 97. I was in charge of the ambushes that year in Lebanon. And I went down to his, uh, where we would shoot with his uh, unit. It was a, a, a special forces unit of Golani. And I shot with the upper, uh, upper receiver of the M4. And I shot the M193, what we call the regular bullet in the IDF. And it did half the group size, half the group size of the SS-109 or the M855. We, we, didn't, we didn't know why. And then we understood that it has to do with speed. Because the M193 is lighter, it's also faster. And because it's faster, it's doing better group size up to certain ranges. So in the IDF, the way we work, up to 200 meters, we use the M193. After 200 meters, we use the M855. Because each one of them is the fastest at that range. From zero to 200, if we start out a little race, my, green, my left hand is the green bullet. My right hand is the M193. I start a, a race, bam. What goes, out, what goes out first? Which one did I say was my green? I don't remember. But <laughs> let's say my right hand is, is the M193. It runs off first. Why? It's, it's, it's lighter and faster. Slowly, 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 the SS-109 catches it and passes it. At what range does it do that? At 300. At 200, it's faster, but it hasn't caught up yet. But at 300, it actually passes it. Because what's happening, it's losing its energy much slower than M193. So we, that's the way we work. Our regular drunk guys, we're all using M193s in IDF. Whether you have a one to seven barrel on the Tavor or the M6 and the M4 or whatever. But if you're a sharpshooter in the IDF using the same weapon, you're gonna be using a, a green tip because it's better at the ranges that you're engaging. So we adapted the round depending on the range. So far, are we clear? So we spoke about the rounds. We spoke about the length of barrel. Now the height of the sight. The height of a sight incredibly affects the trajectory as well because in one point, I can be aiming here. Let's say this is the barrel, and this is the way it goes. And I have a sight low, but if I have a sight who's high, now this is my line of sight. So now I'm crossing here instead of crossing here. So again, the trajectory will be affected by which sight you have. So don't assume if I put an optic on my gun, and then I put a telescope on it, that the zeroing is going to be the same. It's going to be totally different. Your point of impact is going to be different. Okay, just because the height of the telescope is in a different place, okay? Now, I spoke to you guys before about when can it be one, 
and when can it be zero? When can I have one point of impact with my line of sight, and when can I have none? I don't know if you guys answered the question, but we'll see it eventually. When do I have one? In the IDF, we have what we call a negative. It's a small machine gun. It's similar to your SAW, I think you guys call it. It's a 556, but it's belt, it's belted. Um, so where do we put the laser? We put the laser on our negative. If this is the barrel, I'm gonna use a different uh, marker here. Okay, and what, what we wanna do, the laser itself is underneath the barrel. The laser, whether it be infrared or visible, is now my line of sight at night, because I can't see anything at night. So I use my laser as an aiming point. Wherever the laser is, I'm, in, I'm aiming, right? So now my line of sight is underneath the barrel. So now when the bullet goes, it only impacts it once when it's falling down. So there's not two points of contact, there's only one, okay? So that changes. Yeah, that's how we do one, okay? The, how do we do none? If you screw up and your gun is not canted. If you're off cant, which happens a lot with the red dots because a dot is a, a dot from every angle. So if I'm now off cant, this will be my line of sight. This is my barrel. If I am now crooked, my barrel, instead of going up and down, is going from left to right. It goes underneath my line of sight. It never crosses it ever. So instead of going from up and then down, it's going from left to right. Why? The barrel, the end of the barrel, is always running after my front sight. So wherever my front sight is, the barrel is following it. So if I'm off cant and my, my sight is to the right, then now my barrel is to the right. So now I'm, I'm low left and I'm going this way, and then the, the round goes from left to right. So what's happening is when, you are, when your weapon is off cant, there's never any point of contact with where I'm aiming. That means I never hit where I'm aiming, at any range, because it's not gonna hit it on the way up, and it's not gonna hit it on the way down, because it's going from left to right, instead of up and down, okay? It's another thing that, that we need to understand. Now, I don't know how you guys call this in, in English, and I apologize, but this is something we call in Hebrew, when it's, yeah, when it's closed, when the flash hydra is closed on the bottom. When this is closed on the bottom, why is it closed? Why do people do that, okay? The problem is, when the gas is leaving the weapon, it goes in all different directions. When it's closed on the bottom, the gas is coming, and then it's closed, it starts to, what we say, do the same action, but because it's closed, it's pressing down on the end of the barrel. So when you have one of these flash hydrants, I think you guys call them, and it's closed on the bottom, this is done for one reason and one reason only, to minimize the jump of the barrel. We do not want the barrel to jump and then by the time it comes back to the target, it took a while. If I'm using a telescope that has a small field of view, then I can lose sight of the target. That's why you always put this when you have a, with a telescope on your, because you, your field of view is much smaller when you have a telescope magnification. So now this is closed. So the gas is coming out of the gun, and then it pushes up and down, and because down it's closed, it pushes down. It's, we see any like ting pizza, to minimize the jump. Does this make the weapon more accurate? 1,000% not. What it allows me to do is shoot the second shot faster because my barrel is moving less between shot number one and shot number two. So because it's closed on the bottom, what happens is I jump less between one and the other, okay? And that's why we do it. But there are problems with this. Almost every flash hider makes the weapon less accurate. If you take it off and you do a grouping without it, even though it's there to protect the end of the barrel, you'll do a better grouping. If it's, if it's improperly put on the weapon, it affects the ballistic path. So always remember that, by the way. You must, must, sometimes we would do that in the idea if we would take it off, we would shoot and you say, whoa, I did a much better group. Then we knew that it was, it was connected wrong to the weapon, and because of that, it was, the gas would start pushing the bullet when it started its trajectory. So always remember that that happens as well. Um, let's see if there's anything else that I want to talk to you guys about before we go. Okay. Two more things. If you guys ever miss in battle, always miss low, okay? Why? Because if you hit below him, you can see the sand or the, 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 the dust coming up so you know you missed. Ricochet, a uh, ricochet, I don't know how you say it in English, um, also does damage. And always the ballistics, if you saw them, they're almost always high. 
So that means wherever I'm aiming, I'm actually hitting above where I'm aiming. So always aim low. It's always the way to do it. People ask me a lot, Mikey, after I zero the gun, can I give my gun to my friend? We're in the range together. Can I give it to him? Will it be zeroed for him as well? Is there a difference between, uh, between our eyes? 1,000%. You can give a gun to your friend and it should be zeroed if he's shooting correctly. When you do this with a telescope slash red dot, it's very, very simple. Why? Because you see a dot. I don't care if he's got this big of an eye or this big of an eye. It means nothing. There's no way to confuse it. The dots on the target, you're aiming the same way. Where does confusion come? Where is the difference between a guy and a guy? The iron sights. When you have iron sights, two different sights, I have to bring my front sight into the middle of the back sight. Now, some of us may see the middle differently, so he puts it a little bit lower or he puts it a little bit higher. In a situation like that, you will see much differences between a, a, a guy and a guy with iron sights more so than the same two people if they were shooting a red dot sight or magnification, which only has one, one front sight. Now guys, to find the middle of the back sight or the rear sight, I don't know if you guys seen this, sometimes on M16s you'll, you'll see two, and there'll be an, a, a letter L on, on, uh, on the back one. L stands for long. This, that means the hole itself is higher than the other one, and the trajectory is much larger. By the way, 25, 375, but that's not relevant now. Inside of these circles, you're gonna see that there's a little conus, that the light comes in from this side. And if you look closely, you can see that inside of your circle, there's two types of, 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 of light that you can see. You can see a gray one on the outer, and on the inner one, you can see a brighter light. And if you concentrate on this, most people have never even seen it, but it's there, I promise, okay? If you look and concentrate on the back side, you'll see it. And what that little light in the middle does the clear light, the clearer light, that's telling you where the middle is. So that's where you're supposed to bring your front sight. So it's there, look for it, and then you just bring it there. It allows you to bring it to the middle better, more accurately, because there's a big play here where it can be. So you don't want to make those kind of mistakes. Um, I think I hit just about everything I wanted to hit. Um, uh, a yell out to uh, Gore Shooters. Uh, you guys are great. I'm glad that we're, we're doing all this stuff together. And uh, Aaron at uh, Shoot Center at Cape Coral, we, we love you guys. And uh, uh, my wife is now landing after about 17 days from uh, Israel with my two kids. So I'm gonna be running here to, to go get them, uh, go see them at least. And love you guys, hope all is well. Stay safe and have a great weekend. Thanks guys.